Hey, hey, welcome back to Over the Horizon. We've got some interesting news for you today. Um, SpaceX has been uh, putting out a few posts on X. Uh, we now know when the next launch of the Starship will be. That's IFT4. We're looking at a window opening up on June 5th. And there's some more interesting stuff that's come out. Let me bring in uh, my guest today to discuss this. Uh, Dr. Scott Walter, mechanical engineer and aerospace engineer. He's uh, the go-to guy for all things robotics and space as well. So welcome, Scott. Great to have you. All right. And it's great to be here and to finally know when that launch date's going to be. Yes. And we can build up uh, or start building up the anticipation. Not that it hasn't right. been building up. Right. Now, remember, with all things launches, uh, you can never trust the dates 100%. We were yeah. starting to get some indications that it was uh, going to be late May and then slipping into June. And then finally we got, I was like three to five weeks away. Then Elon yeah. said two weeks. And of course, whenever he says two weeks, everyone goes, yeah, okay. You know, we don't know. Then he said, I think yesterday, 10 days, which would have made it the first. And then today right. we see the statement coming out from uh, SpaceX saying, um, you know, uh, as soon as the fifth, you know, that, that's, that's it. Or basically yes. the jargon they tend to use is net, which means not earlier than. So, yeah. and I know a bunch of friends that canceled their vacation or their um, their reservations over that weekend of the 1st of June, <laughs> they've already moved it. So they're all expecting it's going to be somewhere around that time. And that's starting to make sense based on other things that I've heard that that's that most of the team there feels comfortable that, that they'll be ready. They've had a uh, definitely a bunch of um, hot tests and stuff like that that have gone well. Uh, we did see that there were road closures starting on the first, which was probably just a pro forma thing that they put in to make sure they had it and that they could change depending upon weather and everything else. So I'm sure those road closures are going to change. I don't think I've seen any um, any of these what they call notums that is noticed to, to to mariners and airmen uh, that have not gone out yet um, to let them know what's going on. And I'm sure as we get closer and closer to that date, they they will know for sure. Yeah, it says pending regulatory approval, but yes. uh, we've seen in the past few, I think it's, it started with IFT2, where mm -hmm. we kind of got to understand what that meant, really. Yes. And that it didn't mean a delay, but it just meant that, look, we're getting things out of the way. It's a procedure. Right, right. And and generally, the, uh, the approval almost comes 24 hours before. And that may be partially intentional, um, and I'm sure SpaceX would not put this out if they weren't confident that that they were going to get to go ahead by that time. And I'm pretty sure that you know the FAA has done enough of the rule; they're they're probably ready to go ahead and give the the approval and the license uh, to move ahead. But you know, with all these things, you may as well just wait to the last minute, you know, because there could be additional information that comes in. So um, I'm sure they're just setting it up. And the other part that came out today was kind of a summary of the uh of the investigation into what went wrong in the first flight and there's like some interesting information in there some tidbits um yeah absolutely and uh, i'm counting on you to help us make sense of what mm -hmm. all of this uh, uh means so let me just um if you will begin kind of by reading out these paragraphs one by one um so essentially the first is is a brief overview of uh, they say Starship is designed to fundamentally alter humanity's access to space. We all know that. The third flight test of Starship and uh, Super Heavy made tremendous strides towards this future. Uh, on the 14th of March, Starship successfully lifted off uh, from Texas. All 33 Raptor engines uh, on the Super Heavy started up successfully, mm -hmm. completed a full duration burn during ascent, followed by hot state separation. Um, this was the second successful ascent of the booster so that's we're getting more and more sure-footed with the booster although problems do remain and we've discussed this in the past with the starship itself and particularly re-entry because if you want it to be a reusable rocket you need to absolutely do a three entry right yeah so and then um so they they made it up to, to hot staging pretty well and i'm trying to see uh they pretty much talk about that they had the separation yeah. and to remind everyone what happens at separation is that they have the 33 Raptors that are lifting up. And as, as you get higher and higher up there, the vehicle gets lighter and lighter. So you almost don't need all the engines to keep you going unless you want to have like, you know, full thrust, full acceleration. So it does make sense to consume your propellant as quickly as possible. It's actually the most efficient way. But just before hot staging, they have to cut it back because then they would have too much thrust in attempting to do that hot staging maneuver. That means that the, the lower stage would bump into the first stage. And rather than doing it the normal way, and the normal way is you just cut the engines, you just do full Miko, and then you do the separation, and then it starts up. 
And there might be like anywhere from a 10 to 15 second gap between the shutdown of the main engines and the startup of the second stage. And the idea of the hot staging was to keep pushing it all the way through because there is a certain amount of efficiency to doing it. But there's another reason, and that is they don't want to have the ullet collapse, meaning that in the in the um, the second stage or the, the Starship, uh, they don't have these ullage motors that would actually guarantee that the propellant will drop to the bottom of the tanks before they start up. So right. that, that's an issue that they have to take care of right there. And they decided to use the first stage to do it, which is why they're pushing all the way through. So right. the um, now in order to do that and make sure you don't over thrust it, that's why they cut down to three engines. So you saw it go from 33 down to three. Yeah, and then and then that makes sure that they never have uh, what you would call sort of negative G's on the boosters. You're always going kind of positive. You're not falling down. And then they had to go through the hot staging. And then when they veer off, then they gave the command to light up all thirteen. So I think you know the the first the the center ring or the the, the three center ones that that are able to gimbal, and also the the other ring that's in there is also able to gimbal. Um, those I believe were burning all the way through, and then you just got that other ring of ten that lit up and they said that command works. I believe that was in the statement. And just to, yes. to help with the props, I've got um, model the starship back here that I will delicately take down so we can kind of go ahead and take a look for anyone that wants to know what's going on. So what you have is you do have the uh, the ring of engines that are here. And so you've got the, the, the three in the middle that are used for like landing burns and um, also during the hot staging. And you have another ring of 10 on the inside and those can all gimbal. And then the outside, uh, was it to see, we got uh, 13, I guess we must have another 20 out because it's 33 total. So those do not gimbal. So um, the only way you'd be able to steer the vehicle with those is with differential thrust, but if they're all thrusting the same way, there's no way you can control the vehicle. But with the, the inner two rings, you've got more than enough to be able to do any sort of maneuvering you want to do. Now, you know, why do the outer ones not gimbal? It's like, you know, gimbling is difficult. <laughs> to, yeah. You know, the mechanism you have to build. So if you can build something without gimbling, it's it's lower mass, it's a little bit easier and everything else. But at the same time, you need to be able to steer the vehicle. So you have to have some of them that move. Some have wondered, it's like whether that inner ring even needs to gimbal at all. And I would not be surprised if in later versions, it's just like the three in the middle gimbal. The middle, yeah. And the other ones, you just use differential thrust uh, to be able yeah. to, to get it to move. So. You know, you know, you can you can steer a car without actually turning the wheels if you just make one wheel move faster than the other. You know, that's it's not as easy as steering, yeah. of course. Yeah. But you know, if you want to change the direction of something, you know, and that's what we mean by you know differential steering. And anyone that's operated a tractor, you know that. You know, the treads they don't turn; they they just go in one direction. And the way you get it to turn is like you make sure one goes a little bit faster than the other. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess you know, in hindsight, when we look at it, I guess we've been a bit spoiled, but with the um, the cadence of Falcon 9 and the success rate of Falcon 9. Mm -hmm. We take a lot of these things so for granted without really understanding how difficult the engineering of it is. Yes, yes. And so they're, they're making a couple of changes. Now, I think later on in that statement, they talk about what went wrong. So we get an idea of um, uh, on there. So, you know, okay, following stage separation, super heavy, initiated the burn back. Okay. And so that was the command yeah. to make sure all 13, the vehicles, 13 Raptor engines are, um, uh, to propel the the rocket toward now it's again that's sort of interesting is that point the um the booster is pretty light you're no longer having to carry this the second stage on top of it it's pretty much depleted of, of fuel yet they want to get back to dodge in a hurry so yeah. so they're, they're burning all those things rather than just the three so they need to ignite that now it's a bit tricky doing that because remember during this whole hot staging this thing is uh, is pushing up then it's kind of falling down a little bit we're trying to make sure it doesn't fall and then it's like flipping off over like this and all you can think of is slosh, slosh, slosh going around there. So you, you've got to make sure that all your propellant tanks and everything are, are working correctly and that you're not getting any voids or gaps in there. And it, the, it seems like later on in the burn that three of them, or, or maybe seven of them, a bunch of just sort of shut down prematurely. Yeah, I think they say um, six engines began shutting down, triggering a benign early boost back shutdown. Benign, right. That sounds like yeah. my prostate. Okay. Um, <laughs> So, so what, what does yeah, this mean? It shut down, didn't cause any damage, but like all, a lot of things that are benign, uh, you know, it can later come back Potential. to bite yeah. you. And, and what that's telling you is that they shut down probably for a reason and that the, the chances of them starting back up was probably like almost nothing. Right. And that's what it right. sounds like we're, we're coming on up here. If, if you can read that, because my eyes 
You can't quite yeah. read it on the screen right now. I think yeah. it's a bit better for you. Yeah. It says the, the booster then continued to descend until attempting its landing burn, which mm -hmm. commands the same 13 engines used to boost back to perform yep. the planned final slowing for the rocket before a soft touchdown in the water. Now, we yes. didn't get to that phase. Um, I mean, at least not not in this, in IFP3, right. or very, we're not expecting very that in IFP4. Yeah. They get very close. Now, one of the differences uh, between um, this and the Falcon, and that kind of surprised me, is, is that the Falcon, you will have a boost back burn when they when they go back to return to launch site. So, right. um, you know, it will flip around and, and start up and go zipping on back that way. Yeah. But they're actually doing it in such a way that they're not like necessarily making it uh, come all the way back. Um, or, or they're doing something like that, but let's say they're not making it go down. Letting right. gravity do that work. So yeah. while they're they're doing this, it's still going up, you know, because it's still basically throwing itself up in the air. And so it goes up and gets up finally to the apogee and then finally starts to fall back down. And the Falcon 9 will do a reentry burn. It went, it's coming down fast yeah. enough that it starts getting too hot and they will actually do a little bit of braking right there to make sure it doesn't overheat. Now, the Falcon is made out of a composite, of, I think, a, a, aluminum lithium skin. And so it can take some heating, but not that much. And they do have some heat shielding on the um, on the engines, but they don't want to get too too hot. This thing's made out of stainless steel, which can take a bit more heating. Right. And they were fine letting it go through. So there was no reentry burn. It's just like, we're just going to go straight to the landing burn and then, you know, do a little bit of the, the control on that. Um, now, I assume they made it to their nominal position. So even though they got a premature shutdown, that they were able to make it over to about the site that they wanted. But when they got ready to command all those to light up, they failed to light up. And then you ended up getting, it sounds like a rud, probably as a result. Right. And I think right. in a later paragraph, they, they explain why. Right. All right. So let's uh, continue. So it says, uh, carries on to say the booster continued to descend, as uh, we just discussed, until it attempted its landing burn, which commands the same 13 engines used to boost back. Um, but six engines that shut down early in the boost back were disabled from attempting the landing burn startup. Okay. Using seven engines commanded to start up with two successfully reaching main stage ignition. So even from the seven remaining, it seems there may have been some There may issues. have been a problem. So so it, it could have been that whatever was causing the problem on those six had migrated over to the others. They just maybe were not aware of it. There there may have been something may have been already compromised. Um the other thing I wonder well they would have given the command to it. I wonder if those seven then had to somehow make up for the deficit of the others. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming that they may not all be going uh, full thrust with it when all 13 light up. So they probably have a certain amount of redundancy in there. And, and maybe in this case they did, <laughs> right. but it seems like contact was lost immediately um, yes. after they attempted to do that. Yeah, and at about 462 meters, um, they, uh, that's where the contact was lost. You think this a higher probability of success with IFT four? Well, we'll find out at because least, if you look stage. at what the root, yeah, if you look at what the root cause is, see the most likely root cause, and, and sort of read that part there, because it right. gives us an idea whether we're going to have more success or not. Right. So it says the most likely root cause for early boost pack uh, burn shutdown was determined to be continued filter blockage, where liquid oxygen is supplied to the engines leading to a loss of inlet pressure in engine oxygen turbo pumps. And yeah. SpaceX implemented hardware changes ahead of Flight 3 to mitigate this issue, which resulted in the booster progressing to its first ever landing burn attempt. So progress has been made, but it still have Wasn't just, enough. I mean, right right. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm trying to remember that um, we were speculating a lot on what the problem was with IFT2. And a lot of the, the feeling was that, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, we were a little bit worried here because there was a lot of sloshing going around there. Engines didn't light up. We didn't know what it was. And finally, the report kind of came in and mentioned something about dry ice. And um, and so, I mean, the speculation here is, and um, Ozan's not here to defend himself, so this is his idea. <laughs> but I, I agree a lot with it, is that if you remember that they're using autonomous uh, pressurization, yeah. And that that is to to fill in the empty space when you when the fuel is being consumed, yeah. and you know just as an example when we say ullage, what we're talking about is you know basically the empty part up there in a container. So if this container is full, I don't really have any ullage, right? But then as I consume, I got to make up for that space. 
Right. So something's got to go in there and replace it. Because if it doesn't, if I'm a rocket engine and you start you know, make, trying to replace it with a vacuum, that's going to start to happen. Your can's going to crush. So you don't want something like that to happen. So they need to have some other gas to fill it in. And normally they use something like helium or some other pressurant, inert gas to be able to do it, to be able to maintain the pressure of it. And uh, Tim Dodd had made mentioned something to yeah. Elon when he had his factory the tour. And Elon kind of thought about something like that, and like, oh, yeah. let's do this autonomous pressurization. And the idea is that yeah. you take the hot gases that are coming out of the exhaust, you, t you bleed a little bit of that off, put it back into the tanks to keep them pressurized. Now, there are pluses and minuses of that. Part of it is that like, oh, you know, the best part is no part. So you get rid of this stuff. The other thing is that pressure gas you typically have to use is helium. And it's it's a precious gas. It's very difficult to get it in the volumes that they'd want to have. And, you know, eventually if they want to be launching lots of these things, you might use up the, the helium supply of, of the planet to be able to do that. So it's like, uh, okay, let, let's see if we can find something else. There are other, let's say, non-inert gases, but they're just not going to work quite as well. So what they're basically doing is they're pumping back in what is probably exhaust gas. And they mentioned in there that the um, the O2 in tank, uh, intake filters were blocked with dry ice. Not in this one, but I think in yeah. the previous report. The previous one. Okay, now I'm going to ask you, what is dry ice? What is it? Carbon dioxide, right? Carbon dioxide, exactly. It's, yeah. not, it's not water ice, it's carbon dioxide, okay? Yeah. So how do you make dry ice <laughs> in a liquid oxygen tank? You put carbon dioxide in there, right? So that, that was like a strong indicator that, yeah, probably the exhaust, because, you know, where's the CO2 coming from? Yeah, right. it's an exhaust product. So when you burn the right. methane, you're producing CO2. You're bleeding that around and you're using that in there and it's you're trying to keep ice. it as a hot gas. The thing is, yeah. you may have hot gas up at the top and like really, really cold liquid cold. down here, but there yeah. is a point of contact right there. Yeah. And so you're going to get freezing in there, whether you want to or not. And then, of course, the other thing that happens is that like I'm going up like this and everything is kind of steady and it's just very easily pushing down, pushing down, pushing down a little bit. And suddenly I start doing this, you know, uh -huh. and then things start getting shook up, right? Yeah. So suddenly that dry ice is going to break apart. That's been there. You're going to probably form a lot more precipitants out of it. And remember now at that point, we're way down here somewhere. So yeah. we're not like we're, we're almost full. We're now at the bottom, which means you're doing stuff like that. And you see when something like that happens, ooh, my manifold, that's starting to get exposed around there. And then I cover it up again. And it's, I'm not surprised. And then it, it looked like they were going to take some, uh, in this, this flight, it sounded like they were going to do something to prevent that. And it seems like right. those mitigation techniques did not work. So right. it may be that this is the last time that they will attempt to use autogenous pressurization. And if they have a problem as a result of that, then they probably will go back to the old way of doing it. Um, now, right. the reason for using helium is that helium is very light. So it's when you, if you need a lot of helium, well, it's not going to have a whole lot of mass. You just have to press it on down. And it's fairly easy to pressurize helium. It's a little bit easier than uh, using um, hydrogen. Um, now, <laughs> This just goes back to the, the other day. I think Scott Manley mentioned something about that uh, on the on the Vulcan that if they, they use something like some sort of helium pressure for something, it would add a lot more mass. And someone asked, "Well, why don't they use uh, hydrogen instead?" To which Tori Bruno <laughs> replied with a classic tweet: "Oh, the humanity!" <laughs> so it's like you want something inert. Inert means it doesn't react. So you do not want to be putting something like hydrogen gas in in uh, your oxygen tank because yeah. all it does is take a spark and that's it. So you want something that yeah. does not react and that's helium. The other thing about helium is in order to turn helium into a liquid, you have to get it really, really cold. So if we use an inert gas like um, uh, like nitrogen, it you know when it comes in contact with liquid oxygen, which I think is like super chilled liquid oxygen, you're probably gonna turn that into, into a liquid as well. I mean, you really wanna keep it as, as a gas because if it's a gas, it fills this thing up. That's the whole yeah. idea. And the other thing is because it's lighter, it's it's not going to want to mix. So if you start putting nitrogen in there where the oxygen is a good chance you're going to get that mixing in, especially when you're going around there, which means you're going to be ingesting some of that nitrogen into your turbo pumps and into your feed, and that's going to affect the chemistry of what's going on in there. So the best thing is to to try to find something a little bit different that will work. And so that's my my biggest mm. question mark is whether that, you know, if they're going to have a success with that, my my concern is that they may find a way to mitigate this. The question is they're going to have to do a calculation on um, what's the frequency going to be that you still get this ingested and that it will cause a, a flame out. 
and whether that's an acceptable risk. Because what you've done by using the autogenous system here is you've introduced a problem you never had before. Yeah. And that's and and you're trying to solve another problem that doesn't really cause any problems. It just has kind of a, a mass and cost penalty. But for all intents and purposes, it's not something that is really problematic. And now you're creating something that is. And so they're going to look at it. And if they look at it and say, oh, you know, the chances are one in a thousand. Well, that's unacceptable, you know. <laughs> You know, and you see, the other thing is, is all I know is if you use helium as pressure gas, the chances of getting blockage from that is like 0%. It's just 0%. Right. <laughs> the yeah. only way you get something in there is because something else is being introduced in there that shouldn't be yeah. introduced in there. Yeah. But now you're introducing something that you know could be problematic. So we'll see whether, you know, and the thing is, you know, I'm not a SpaceX engineer. <laughs> they have more data. They're way smarter than me. They may know, but, you know, they may come to that conclusion. That, um, that that they have to go to a different system or a different approach. Yeah, well, IFT four is definitely going to be uh, very interesting for a lot of uh, a lot of these touch points. Let's um, carry on. Okay, so so super heavy boosters for flight four and beyond will get additional hardware inside the oxygen tanks to mm -hmm. further improve propellant filtration capabilities. Uh, yes, and so it's a filtration. You know, and that's the whole yeah. thing. Is they're going to come down? It's like clog filters. It's like. You know, if you weren't using yeah. that, yeah. you wouldn't need those filters. Yeah. They, they, they is, probably always want a certain amount of filtering for whatever in case, you know, some debris it, or something gets in there. It does seem but, rather uncharacteristic of, of the way SpaceX has gone about its engineering so far. Yeah, yeah. I and guess. and we're going to be getting another, well, another part that's a little bit uncharacteristic here in a second. Okay, right. so now the next is several... So we went to the ghost phase. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. So we and went to the ghost phase, right. Mm-hmm. And it says the vehicle accomplished several of the flight test's additional objectives, including the first ever test of its payload door in space. So remember we were talking about this and whether mm. there were problems with the payload, payload door. Not closing. Um, yeah, not closing. And it says uh, the vehicle also successfully completed a propellant transfer demonstration. This was mm -hmm. another point that we were kind of unsure about. Um, and this, of course, involved moving liquid oxygen from a header tank into the main tank. This test provided valuable data for eventual ship-to-ship -ship propellant transfers that will enable missions like returning astronauts to the moon under the Artemis program. And of course, also to Mars uh, in the long term. Mm -hmm. So these are two, two big successes, right? Uh, these are two big takeaways. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about whether they did achieve these, uh, these two milestones. We now know that they have. Right, the third one they did not. And that's mentioned later, okay? Right, so seven minutes after Starship began its course phase, the vehicle began losing the ability to control its attitude. And this is something we discussed in the, in the analysis of IFT3. Starship continued flying its nominal trajectory, but given the loss of attitude control, the vehicle automatically triggered a pre-planned command to skip its planned on-orbit relight of a single Raptor engine. This, again, was something we discussed. We now know uh, a little more about mm -hmm. what went wrong. Help us understand this, Scott. Okay, I think uh, they talk a little bit about uh, what was going on there. So the attitude control is that when the vehicle is, is heading a certain direction, you want to be able to control whether it's moving this way, up and down. So basically what you would call, you know, like a pitching to be up and down, yawing back and forth in a roll this way. And so, you know, the combination that would be controlling its attitude and something happened to the reaction control system, which are these little thrusters that are around the vehicle that would allow it to move in certain directions. And to, to us, it seemed like it was spinning this way, kind of doing a yawing movement is what we were observing. Yes. Um, I'm not sure, you know, they, they said they'd lost the control of the roll, which seems to be, you know, a, a different attitude to me. We may have looked at it wrong, but certainly when they went into the reentry, they were losing the roll there because we, we see it was like it was on a barbecue pit, right? Yeah. And it was just sort of slowly rolling around this way. So it's definitely on the reentry, they lost it, but I think they were also losing it uh, somewhere else. And that's possible because a lot of times it's a combination of these different thrusters that can come into play that will give you control of um, various uh, degrees of attitude. And I think the interesting thing when they, they talked about in there is that they experienced higher heating on all the surfaces and i was like well wait a higher you know i expected the the upper part which you where you don't have any thermal insulation yeah of course right. it's gonna be a lot hotter than you expect but the part where you've got the, the thermal blanket you would yeah. think not and 
the only reason I could think that they may have been exposing it is whether they're talking about what the skin temperature was versus the actual temperature of the tiles. Because pretty clear, if you're heating the top part, which is completely exposed, this is made out of what material again? <laughs> right? Yeah. Stainless steel, right? right? And what happens if you take something like steel and, and like, you know, put it into a flame, you know, on one end, you kind of feel it on the other end pretty quickly. So I would not be surprised if when this got really hot, it conducted a lot of heat whoop, right, right through the, the backside as well. So right. suddenly the, the thermal protection was almost of, of no value because of that rotisserie movement that you were going through. And so I'm not yeah. surprised that the vehicle failed. I, I, I assume it failed on the exposed side and, and not the underside. Because I don't yeah. think the underside would have been that hot. I mean, still would have had a little bit of care. protection. But yeah. yeah, it could have been anything. And, and those tanks could easily rupture from getting too hot. Right. Unless do you and we would we we remember we saw those rather large chunks of, of tiles mm -hmm. and the insulation flying off. Do you think that those points where the, the 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 steel was exposed could have led to uneven heating patterns and that could have also oh, yeah, it, it could, you know, because with the a lot of vehicles, I mean there's there's certain parts that are way more vulnerable than others. Others they'll be able to take it and it's just that one if it's in the wrong place. That's, you know, you just get the zippering effect and, and everything kind of falls apart from there. Yeah. So um, a bunch of things like that could happen, but I, I don't think they would have been that unlucky that, you know, it just happened to be that one particular spot it was, is probably that it was just overall getting pretty bad and that you were having yeah. a lot of, of heat tiles coming off, causing a lot of overheating different places. But the most important thing is understanding why they had that loss of the attitude control. And I think somewhere they mentioned something again about that root cause, and you might want to take a, take a look and read that. Okay, so here we go. The most likely root cause of the un, uh, unplanned roll was determined to be clogging of the valves responsible for roll control. SpaceX has since added additional roll control clusters on upcoming Starships to improve, improve attitude control redundancy and upgraded hardware for improved resilience to blockage. Um, this, is, this is concerning me because clogging of the valves, the, the valves should not be getting clogged. Right. I mean, if if you're if the contents of your tanks are are made out of pure material, you know, pure oxygen, pure methane, what the heck could be clogging the valves? Yeah. Unless you know some sort of particulates What's or ice case? or something else is getting in there. And I'm wondering, right. it's like, are we talking about the same problem here? Are we talking about dry ice getting in there? So if if that if that you know if that is you know, that's not the root cause, then <laughs> the root cause is you're 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 getting some stuff into your uh, your your fuel system which is causing this problem and you know that's that's something is is yes uh, you know and and our ice vehicles and stuff like that we do have fuel filters and stuff like that to prevent against that, that but that's yeah, just because yeah. debris shouldn't be getting into our 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 fuel tanks in the first place so if you can guarantee there's no debris in there then you shouldn't be seeing these clogs uh, then it looks like they've decided they have to put some sort of redundancy in there because they don't trust them that hopefully they're not saying well the solution is that we might get one or two of these clogging every now and then because the stupid dry ice problem here but we put enough mm -hmm. of them on there we should have enough redundancy <laughs> i'm shaking my head at that and like no Let, let's get down to fixing what might be the root issue and that is yeah. why is debris getting in there in the first place if the root is root cause of the problem is not um is not tackled they, they could yeah. be and, and, manifestations and, 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 in other ways right, right. And, and Ozan posted on, on this, he, he, you know, he was just like, okay, but, but what, what was clogging in? They wanted to know a bit more. And again, what was in the filter? So we're getting some information, but we're getting incomplete information. And, and the best right. we can do is guess that it's probably coming from dry ice, especially if they're using the autogenous pressurization on both systems. Um, that's the only, the only solids I can think of, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, our hair is getting in there, you know? <laughs> It's like they clog her drains. That's what it almost sounds like. So, yeah. uh, but I don't think it is. It's it, it's got to be that there's something in there, or there's some. The only other thing could be potentially something with the, a manufacturing issue that you're manufacturing mm. something and debris, you know, shavings, other stuff is getting in there that you just aren't clearing out. But that's something you should be able to take care of, you know, without because you're going through all these different, um, you know tests of uh, wet dress rehearsals and everything, you should be able to get all that debris out, make sure it's clean. So I don't right. think that would be that. that so they, they really have to find out where that's coming from. Right. All right, so moving on, um, they say follow, following the flight tests, takes led the investigation efforts with oversights from the FAA. Again, uh, just to let uh, viewers mm -hmm. know that this is the process. It's not as if the FAA comes back and says, okay, these are the things you need to fix. 
it's SpaceX that does its own internal investigation, then submits a report to the FAA saying, okay, look, we've we've done our investigations and X, Y, Z, one, two, three, these, this is what we need to fix, and this is what we're going to fix. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. And then mm -hmm. that goes ahead. Correct, correct. And, and I think the most important thing that comes out when, when you read the paragraph is that while they had issues, the issues happened where they were supposed to, and that is yeah. where there was like a warning. So yeah. in IFT2, when the, the booster exploded, um, it didn't, it, it kind of detonated not where they're expecting it to. So you had stuff raining down over, even though it was like an anticipated debris field, it was like not really where they wanted it to be. And then, um, then later on, of course, they, they had the, um, um, the, uh, not, not the rud, but the, um, flight termination system, hmm. uh, that, that was triggered. So that, again, that's another reason for investigation. In this case, they didn't have any of that. They enough things were under control that it was like the FAA yeah. is probably just going to say, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. It says during flight three, neither vehicles, um, automated flight safety systems was triggered and no vehicle debris impacted outside of the predefined hazard areas, which is, mm -hmm. it's good to get past that stage because um, you don't want the fish and wildlife uh, authorities uh, getting involved. Yes. Yes. In, in mariners and everything else that, you yeah. know, you said we, you know, this area would be safe and stuff rained down on top of my fishing trawler. What's going on here? And um, all right, let's move on. Upgrades derived from the flight test will debut on the next launch, IFT4, as we turn our focus from achieving orbit to demonstrating the ability to return and reuse Starship and Super mm -hmm. The team incorporated numerous hardware and software improvements in addition to operational changes, including the jet jettison of the Super Heavy's hot stage adapter, following boost back to reduce booster mass from the final phase of flight. That yes, so um, I'm going to get to to that one sort of in a second here. Is that mm -hmm. um, so? They they've gone ahead and they're, they're pretty confident everything is going to to work well with whatever little changes they've made, um, and they're getting rid of all the tests. So right now the focus is on successful recovery of the booster and and successful reentry. So I don't think they're going to attempt to redo any of the tests. There's almost no need. Uh, they're probably saying like, we're not going to do the fuel transfer. We're not going to open that door if there's even a door on there, uh, the yes. cargo bay door. So they're not going to bother. And I'm not sure if they're even going to attempt to restart uh, in orbit. That's, so that they, was what I was going to ask you about. Do you yeah. think uh, there is a there's room, room it, to it, try it seems, that or is that the, too much? Maybe, but it might be that they've decided that the priority is to really make sure we go through and we'll, we'll do that test later. So th th that's my reading is like, nope, we're not going to do anything else. We're really just sticking right to the, the plan. Yeah. As part of that plan, they've thrown in something to me is is definitely a bit of a shocker. And I, I don't see the reason why you'd want to do it. And they said they're going to jettison the hot stage ring. Yeah. So if you remember, and when, when I ended up, you know, getting this rocket and ordering it, the hot staging wasn't a thing yet. So it has come without it. You can now yeah. actually order this thing with the hot stage ring to put on there to oh, show it on yes. there. And ironically, of course, it is detachable, uh, which is either the surprise. So the, the hot staging ring that they put on top of here, which creates the vents. So now rather than this being completely sealed off, it's offset a little bit here. And they have this, this venting in, in these grids that will allow that when the second stage lights up, there's a right. place for the exhaust gas to, to go out. And that had to be made in a certain way. And it actually was something that they they built to go on top of it. They didn't redesign the whole booster. It's an addendum that you're able to put on the top. And right. of course, that mechanism had already be designed. You know, they've got kind of a latching mechanism down here already. Maybe that's why they're already using it, is that they already have sort of an interface between the booster and the second stage. Right. And they more or less, when they came up here, they duplicated it on the top to be able to do the same thing. And it looks like it might be a minimum of actually just three hold down clamps. I, I thought that it looks like there's room for at least six, but you can get by with a minimum from a mechanical yeah. engineering standpoint, you know, everything yeah. else that three is all you need. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, for like redundancy and stuff like that, you'd almost want to think that you have a bit more, but they have at least three. And they must be thinking of doing the same thing here so they could jettison that ring. So, um, I've got some concerns um, about that. And that is, it appears the reason that they want to do it is to reduce the mass for landing. Mm -hmm. That's it. I mean, it has nothing to do with the rest of it. It's just for landing. And why are they so concerned that that little bit of extra mass up there is going to affect the landing? Is it that they really want to stick it and not have any, you know, anything that could cause a problem? Because that doesn't, that seems pretty small compared to the mass of everything else. Now it is maybe a little bit heavy to makes a little bit top heavy up here. 
even though you know most of the the fuel will have drained down to the bottom yeah. so for some reason they might not like the way it affects the center of gravity or whatever the margins they have them it might be that well what if we lose six raptors again you know we may not have enough thrust to bring the whole booster down plus the ring so they may be looking right. at it that way i'm looking right. at it another way well first it's supposed to be fully reusable and now you're, you're throwing away you know maybe a half a percent of the vehicle that you're going to have to yeah. recover now there's nothing like really sophisticated about it it's just like a, a steel ring and probably all the sophisticated stuff the clamps are actually on both sides you know so that thing literally is just an inert piece of steel with holes in it and, and, and nothing more but um the the hot staging maneuver is already something which is perilous that you know there's there's a always concerned that everything has to go just right just to make just sure right, that the, yeah. the two stages don't bump into each other that there's no damage and so you're going away and rather than jettisoning the hot stage ring at that point they're deciding to hold on to it and the reason is because they just don't want that ring to like accidentally bump into the the booster or, anything, or the second stage or come down to the booster or all that so it's like look let's not mess with that but you're now taking a hot stage ring, which was in the first one, was you know really physically attached quite strongly. It was welded on there. To now you get yeah. these mechanical hold downs that you're hoping is going to be able to provide the same sense of rigidity and everything you need all the way from launch, boost, everything. Hmm. So that's like introducing a wild card or variable that is, you know, my my first instinct is like, nah, not gonna have that. <laughs> you know, I want that thing on there welded and solid. And they're taking it through boost back. And it was commented by a, a friend of Ozan's and AS. I was like, well, wait a minute. It's like, you know, you why bring this thing through boost back? Uh, why not shed it earlier? And part of it is probably just that it's a very complicated thing to do. It's like it, you just don't want that thing to get in the way. So you're carrying that mass for the Delta V. And it seems like they realize that mass is nothing for the boost back. It's not going to affect the boost back by much at all. It seems like that mass is a concern for the landing burn that uh, they don't want to have it there. But still, my concern is that how what, what's the jettison maneuver? What does it look like? How do you make sure you dump that thing without it accidentally bumping? Because it's right up here where the grid fins are. You know, yeah. There, there's stuff that you just don't want it to happen either way. So, so that thing's yeah. going to pop off the right way. Yeah. And there's a, there's several ways of jettisoning. First, you have to get the mechanically it has to get detached. You 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 have to like take the clamps off so now that it's not on there. And then you need to make sure there's something that pushes it away. So, you know, I mean, you're going to have to have springs or something else. I don't think they're going to use explosive bolts, but you're going to need something to make sure you shove that thing out to get it out of the way and make sure you, you do it with enough oomph that it goes away and doesn't accidentally come around and impact with something. So you're not going to do it during the boost back when you're kind of pushing in this way, because if you're trying to pop it out, you're basically going to run into it. So imagine they, they may be doing it when it's finally turning around and coming back on down and they're hoping... Well, we're going to pop it out, but at the same time, you got to pop it out at the right time to make sure that if you're entering the atmosphere here, you're slowing down and that thing might pop off and you're decelerating more than this and it's just going to come back and, and bang into you. So I don't know how they're figuring out. And I hope it's not going to be, you know what? what? Centripetal acceleration. I hope it's not going to be that. Oh my God. <laughs> I, I hope it's not like, let's just start putting yeah. it into a tumble and then pop that thing out and just see where it goes. That, that could be. <laughs> Knowing SpaceX, they're going to try that. Oh no! Yeah, but they, they'll obviously want to try that over a large stretch of water because you don't want it. Yeah, yeah, know, yeah. And and the thing is, that's a piece of debris that's coming down, and you have to predict yeah, exactly. where that's coming down. And that's yeah. not like those fairings that are that come down in a parachute and aren't really going to hurt anyone. Yeah. This thing is coming down, and nothing is going to slow it down. Uh, right. And so it, it's and I, I assume this is like a temporary solution, and it's not the permanent solution going forward because yeah. think about it. I don't oh, think so. We want to have a, you know, three times a day we want to use this. Well, every time we kind of come back, we got to pop another ring in there. <laughs> You're just going to look over the side and there's going to be this huge supply of ring. I mean, I want to be the ring supplier for this, for SpaceX <laughs> right now. You know, I'll just go out there and say, I'll supply them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah what, what's your best guess as to at what stage after say separation do you think they're going to get rid of this? Right at the start? No, because right because they go straight into boost back. So uh, you you're thrusting the whole way, and you never want to turn it off because as soon as you do that, you get that ullage problem. So they're going to keep boosting on here. So they go from three engines that are down at at almost like forty percent right when they do the hot staging to these things. Then you know get up. I think a, a little bit more since they're burning. I mean that's what I would do is I'd use them for a little bit of ullage, and then once I get you know some really good ullage, make sure I've got really good settling, then I'd light up the remaining. 
make sure the slosh, you know, do a little bit of anti-slosh. And then you're pushing through. You're pushing, 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 pushing. And then finally you shut down. At that point that you shut down, then you can consider jettisoning the ring. And I don't know if that's the best point of like, just as soon as the boost is over to go ahead and say, we'll jettison right now. And hopefully we have a good separation of that thing. And then it just kind of falls away in a particular way. So it could be right after the boost back or it's, it's later on because you know, my, my concern is you're kind of moving in that direction and the, the ring is there. And do you want to kind of be moving the direction where the ring is? Can you really pop it out versus when you're kind of coming down this way um, it, you're pointing in a different direction, but again, you've got the atmosphere and everything else. So I don't know. I, I'm sure they've played out many different scenarios of where they're going to do it. Right. Oh, we just have to wait and see, I guess, um, you know, what, what they choose to do. Um, all right. So they say the team incorporated numerous hardware and software improvements, which we've discussed. The third flight of Starship provided a glimpse through brilliant plasma. Oh, that plasma. You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, the brilliant plasma of uh, rapidly reusable future on the horizon. We're continuing to rapidly develop Starship, putting flight hardware in a flight environment to learn as quickly as possible as we build a fully reusable transportation system designed to carry crew and cargo to Earth orbit, the moon, Mars, and beyond. Mm -hmm. Yes, and now I think the, I'm not sure if it was in that part of it or in the other, they talked again a little bit about the mission profile and what they're going to do. And the one thing that they, they mentioned is that they're still technically not going into what would be considered a proper orbit um, because it will be able to return on its own. So they do not need to light up to return. There will not be a retrograde burn or anything like that. And that's intentional to make sure if anything goes wrong, the ship comes back down. But it doesn't mean that they don't have the capability to go in there. It's just, again, it's a test to, to verify. And they probably won't until they are able to verify that they can light the Raptors up in orbit, um, which may be, you know, the next mission after that before they actually attempt to do, let's say, a, a full orbit or several orbits before they come back down when they know absolutely they can. The other thing is I would think they could have some sort of redundancy built in there that between your reaction control system, you mm -hmm. might be able to get enough delta V to uh, allow you to then decay especially if you get yourself kind of with a, a low perigee enough that you, you might be able to, to bite into the atmosphere to slow you down and then to decay. So uh, in some cases, it doesn't take that much, but you know, I think they prefer to use the, the Raptors to, to be able to reenter. All right, so the last time around, we saw them target the Indian Ocean region. Um, do you think this is going to be a similar flight path? Yes, yes, I think, I think that's what they said, that they're, they're still targeting the Indian Ocean. Um, I'm not right. sure why they uh, switched to the Indian Ocean from off the coast of Hawaii, um, whether it was just something about the uh, orbital mechanics that made it make more sense to go ahead and uh, and do that. And and you the other thing is, you got to remember, you, you got to cross the equator a couple of times. So I guess when they come back up around, yeah, they should be up back around the, the coast of Hawaii. Um, so they would be able to do it. And, and a lot of it is just like, you know, threading that needle going over the Caribbean. You have the island groups there. You want to make sure that you, you know, aren't falling. If something goes wrong, you're not you're yeah. going to have a debris, debris field there. Yeah. And, and that kind of influences um, the, the the kind of orbit that you'd be able to, to insert yourself into. So if we recall, then see, it, does it go over Yucatan? I'm not sure. It's really hard to tell in that graphic. It, it appears so. But I know they don't want to go over Cuba, but it uh, looks like, yeah, the, okay, they're going through like the Strait of Florida. And they're not, unfortunately, they're not going over Florida. And, you know, I wish they would. I'd have a beautiful yeah. view from here. Lovely but view. I guess they're, maybe eventually they will, you know, when they're, yeah. they're confident enough that they can actually launch more over land. Well, I, I guess um, there's, there's a lot to look forward to um, on the 5th of June. The window opens. Mm -hmm. so hopefully, I mean, it's it's uh, definitely not earlier. It's just maybe one or two days, uh, depending yes. on the weather conditions and, and as I, well. I think they still have like uh, maybe another static fire uh, in there somewhere along the way. Um, and so we have to keep an eye on that. So yeah, I think that's towards the end of, end of, end of uh, May, end of May, yeah. some, some, something like that. So um, if that goes flawless, then, you know, they're probably right on schedule for, for June 5th. Um, yeah. But if there's like issues with that, then okay, there could be further delay. Right. All right, great. Well, um, thank you so much, Scott. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have to leave it at that. It's been wonderful having you break this uh, latest uh, Starship update, uh, break it down mm -hmm. for us and give us all the insight, all this wonderful insight. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, we're going to be working towards a few more uh, chats as we progress towards IFT4. 
Um, yes, absolutely. It's been, yeah, it's been really fun having you. And hopefully we'll have uh, Ozan and uh, maybe Ed as well with us back, uh, uh, maybe a few others. Depending on schedules, right. and, and, and Ozan will have to, schedules to we'll have to defend his honor. You know, it's like, wait, I don't know when they came with it. You know, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. All right. So, thank you so much, uh, Scott. It's been mm -hmm. wonderful having you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Ryden.